We've got a lot to talk about today, okay? Get excited. It's Freaky Friday, okay? Freaky Friday, woke scotus won't let wife beaters own guns. Trump gets, is Trump gets glazed by VC Bros podcast. Um, debate anticipation rises. Louisiana Ten Commandments in classrooms pushed by insane people. Elden Lord returns. AJ, oh yeah, Al Jazeera documentary. I'm gonna do that as well. AJ documentary on Israel. When Lord returns, I forgot everything. Stop coping and start praying, you idiots. Yeah, start praying, dude. I think I might like start playing Elden Ring on the PC first, um, just to like warm up and then switch over to my normal account. Cause I do need to like, I definitely need to warm up. Like, I don't remember anything, dude. Anyway, update all your drivers. The DLC scuffed on PCs. Okay, well, fear not. Then, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll just go directly into playing on uh, the, the PlayStation. Here it is, by the way. We're blasting. We're blasting. I'm blasting. Your ass hasn't beaten Mog. Yeah, we're going to have to do a warm up <laughs> on the Mog. You're still over level as f for the DLC. You'll be fine. No, I'm 143. I'm not over leveled, I don't think. Son, did you cover the story of the league player who broke up with his girlfriend so he could keep on playing? Yeah, that dude is like, I don't think 143 is over leveled, by the way. I don't even have 60 vigor, so I'm probably under leveled. Uh, people are saying that you can't even over level for this. Shit, so I'm actually scared. Your for DLC is between 125 to 150 level. Okay. Yeah, people are saying if you don't have Vigor at 60, you're going to have a hard time. And I looked at my Vigor and it's like, I'm going to need to spam that. The GDF video debunks the state of Israel. I watched Dav try one boss for like four hours today and she's actually good at the game. You cooked. First of all, I'm actually good at the game too. I just need to warm up a little bit. And we're going to see that today, hopefully. Okay. We're going to see it today. You're going to see it in a little bit when I get on and I, uh, you know, try my in hand at this stuff okay uh, can you do an elder ring plot recap for those of us who haven't watched and played it honestly it's a from software game uh you're not going to understand the plot even while i'm playing it unless you watch an eight hour documentary on what the f the intricacies are that's not what from software games are for uh yeah so don't worry about the plot don't worry about the plot unless you want to watch like eight hours of vati vidya there's a video of Chinese kindergartners destroying every DLC boss on their first tries. Yeah. So, yeah. Can you please, can you please see what your friend put on my timeline? Hi, my name is Aaron, and I'm bringing Worth's Carmel candies. You ready? Mm-hmm. My name is Shame, and I'm down. Bro, has a Domino's hat on. That's crazy. Kaya, please. Get back on there. What the hell is a candy salad, bro? They didn't even unpack the Werther's. I feel like it's such a big deal to sit on that thing. God damn. You can't go ban for ban with that man? Yeah, probably not. My name is Steve, and I brought nice, nice um, fruit flavored candy. Hi, my name is Peter, and I brought Metamucil Fiber Capsules. Hello there, my name is Maurice, and I have dried plums. Hmm. Come on out, come on out, boys. My name is Joseph, and I brought some Save by Travel Sweets lemon candy. The account is called Old Jewish Men. This is cute as hell. That man put the fiber pills in there. Dude, this is awesome. When did conspiracy yeah, theories get so crazy? Yeah, we'll do the Curtis video in a little bit. Um, the most depressing thing you've... That is the most depressing thing you've ever shown on stream? Wait, why? Bro, I love when, like, old people are just having a good old time. What do you mean? I think it's awesome. Cute old people are great. They're having fun. Yeah, this is adorable, dude. Adorkable. I think this is great. What's the best way to go for streaming? Laptop or PC? I mean, I use both, but probably PC is better when you're first starting off. I don't know. It's got more power. Just don't let him in Congress. You don't know if these guys are assholes. Long time sub and lurker. Can we please watch this for the... For the nun nerds in the chat, dude, it's already on the docket. Don't worry. I've been very excited to watch this steroids are awesome video. I've literally had it on the docket since it came out. I found out that Jeff and I have the same level of uh, testosterone in our blood, by the way, which I thought was cool. It's like positively average. 
T levels are almost identical. Um. Anyway, yeah, and yes, they're with the Baghdad. That's cool. And then the video is fun. Slime got cooked. Okay, spoiler alert. Ludwig versus Child Prodigy Basketball Edition. I'm excited to watch this too. Alex Jones loses his Alex personal Jones fortune in bankruptcy. We could do that as well. The old Jewish man TikTok is really cute. They're very passionate about Costco chicken. I'm very passionate about Costco chicken too. Okay, we'll maybe look at this later. All right. Is that like when girls are the period at the same time, but for us dudes... Have you seen this? I was dying. And, and you, my man, yeah, I have seen it. It's very funny. But you know what? We'll give it another rewatch, okay? It's pretty and, good. And you, my man, what do you do? I'm an investigator. You're an investigator? <laughs> what kind? Like for the police? You're a war crimes <laughs> inve- Is that true? Is that true? Oh my god. Jeez, we really went up a notch, didn't we? Until then, it was just all fun. Like, oh, first date in the front row. And you're like, I'm here to investigate war crimes. <laughs> what are you working on at the moment? What's your... Ukraine. You're working on investigating war crimes in Ukraine. Uh -huh. yeah. me, man. I thought when you said infrastructure, it was like going to kill the energy, but fuck you. <laughs> you came to win. I like it. And are you, are you from the UK? No. No, where are you from? Israel. You're from Israel. It's great. I mean, it's like, it's perfect, bro. What? Open Sauce graciously let us set up in the YouTube museum. We're applauding YouTubers so we fit right in. Come say hi. No, we didn't. Fuck you for declining sponsorship, then sneaking a booth into my creator museum selling $700 drawing robots. They did not have permission. The founder at the event was very annoyed to find out this happened after they declined to sponsor the event. What the f Open Sauce. What are these guys doing? This you at 30 seconds? No! I can't believe I just that punchline up i'm sorry we're gonna run it are back you, and are you are you from the uk and then we'll look no, at where it. are you from Israel. you're from it's great oh my god <laughs> jesus christ of all the places you could have said you're an, you're a war crimes investigator from israel looking at ukraine i think the call may be coming from inside the house that's a great that's a great one yeah, he's right um, what is this? Is this anti-Semitism or no? Anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews are being attacked by Zionist protesters during a pro-Palestine protest in Brooklyn. Oh, no. Bro, I swear to God, Zionists literally think it's Israel wherever they are. Okay? This is the most Israel shit you can do. It feels like we're watching a video from Jerusalem. Okay? You got Zionists beating on anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews. Like, what is this? Is this Jerusalem? What the fuck is going on right now? Unironically, this shit looks. This is a, this is a picture, a standard picture of like an average Jerusalem day. Okay. No! Behind 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 this guy looks like me. You think that guy looks like me? That's crazy, bro. What the? They know me. It's so funny that they keep saying Sharmuta. Someone told me that Hebrew doesn't have a lot of like slurs in it because it's like a like a religious language originally. And that's why they have to like rely on Arabic swear words. Is that is that true? Is that the reason why Hebrew doesn't have like a lot of uh Hebrew doesn't have like a lot of bad words in it, like bad no no words, like curse words? Yeah, Hebrew is liturgical. So honestly, it's probably not true. That's what I've heard. We're not talking about Yiddish. Yiddish has slang. Yiddish literally has uh, all any matter of different, all matters, all kinds of different slang. But um, like you might have noticed, you might have noticed that a lot of Israelis will use Arabic words, like Arabic loan words. Well, I guess, I don't know if it's uh, an Israeli doing it. I guess, like, it depends. I mean, there are Arab, uh, like, there are plenty of, of Israelis that are, uh, you know, originally from Arab countries and shit. <laughs> but, like, when they ride the Israeli identity, technically, it, it, it goes from being a loan word to being a steel, stolen word, kind of. What? Dutch Hamas tunnel replica art installation sparks pro-Palestine protests. Yeah, but like Israelis use Sharmuta, which is which is Arabic. Yemeni Jews preserved Hebrew, but the Israeli version of Hebrew was artificially revived and just appropriates other words and expressions, often even from English. It's way for anti-Semitic Zionists to distance themselves from the weak Yiddish. Yeah, drama.
the girls are fighting. Nobody was calling people a bitch in the Talmud, Hassan. You got to improvise somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, they'll say Sharmuta, which is in Arabic. I just learned Verklempt is German, not Yiddish. Bro, what do you think Yiddish is? Like, Yiddish is literally... It's like a... It's like a version. It's not... It's not like actually... It's not technically the exact same as German, but like... It's Germanic. Bro, you're killing me? Oh, someone... Yeah, someone said it's like German Creole. Yeah. Celtics fans will never be the racism allegations. All right, we're moving on from that. Germanic is when Germa has racing thoughts. Have you seen or watched Channel 5 Andrew Callahan comeback docs this past couple of months? Are you just avoiding Andrew C stuff because of the controversy? You're just interested or unaware? It's really some amazing journalism and great stuff to cover and react to. Brother, let me ask you a question. Why are you spamming this in the chat? Like, if that's the reason, if that is the reason, like, why are you spamming this? Why does everybody have their pet project in the chat and they just go crazy they go nutty mode over it okay for me i am uh i am a, a a believer in rehabilitation i'm a believer in uh people taking accountability and and rehabilitating and and becoming the best version of themselves i don't know where uh, andrew is at in his life i haven't kept up with his work i haven't kept up with him at all i don't know you know so I just haven't kept up with it. That's it. We want to hear your thoughts on the matter. Get over it. Yeah, but it's annoying and stupid. And you're literally <laughs> drama lobbying is correct. That is literally what that is. It basically feels like it, it basically feels like drama lobbying in the chat. Like we're covering some other shit and you're like, no, actually get over it. Like, no, I, I need to hear this from you. Like it feels weird. Anyway, let's continue. Yay, we did it. We got these Jews out of here. Like, like what, what did you do, bro? Sick, man. Good work. Look at this bitch. Yo, yo, look. We got another bitch. Yo, hop over the border, buddy. Oh, shit. What are you talking about? Yo, 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 yo. You want to punch me in the face? Punch me in the face. In the face, motherfucker. This clip they actually chased two anti zionists across the street, not the Nantarai Karda. No, I'm just, it's like ridiculous. Hey, a majority report. Thank you for the raid. Hope you had a good stream. Sorry, Emma, I didn't get back to you. I don't know if you're in here right now, but um, I was like, I didn't see your text message until uh, it was too late. And also in the mornings, I am doing research and also working out. So I could not have attended this stream today. Hope you had a good one, though. I watched a little bit of it, it looked very good. I like the, um, I don't know if you guys like swapped the, the structure, but you're doing all news on Friday. I was a big fan of that. And luckily you were able to get an infinitely more handsome guest than myself, uh, who was way funnier, Matt Lieb. So thanks for the raid. And also thanks for the raid. Ambigubot. Always working on instead of linking up with the majority report. Why do extreme Zionists always seem to have so much free time and nothing better to do? Uh, it's the same principle behind like protesters who travel from all around California, specifically Orange County to go to like any kind of protest in, in Los Angeles. Reactionaries basically always have some kind of financing in the sense that like it's not astroturfed or whatever. It can be, but you know, they just have disposable income and free time. They have disposable income. They have free time. They're angry and they want to blow off some steam and what better way to do that what better way to blow off steam than to uh i don't know get in there and yell at a couple pro-palestinian protesters or uh go to a parent teacher association conference and talk about how the kids are being turned gay reactionaries always got free time it's not like they got a job to worry about uh, we got the steroid. Uh, Al Jazeera, the night won't end. Biden's war on Gaza. Uh, this is a really cool article I saw. Also, shout out to Misgif. Doing the damn thing, finally. Uh, he's getting hair plugs. He's in New York. Getting them. He's not in Turkey, which I think is disrespectful to the genre. Disrespectful to the, to the entire industry. The fact that he was, like, willing to fly, but not all the way to Turkey to get the best possible plugs he could get. Bullshit. Those plugs are going to fall off, man. Uh, it's funny that he's getting hair plugs while also <laughs> he's restoring. 
He's restoring his hairline while watching Asmund bald. That is irony. No. Um, this is a really good. What the f is going on? Uh oh. Is my internet busted or is the Twitch app busted? What the f is a hair plug? Okay. Are you going to cover this? Celtics parade has no aura. That is not the Celtics parade. A video from that today can be seen here. Okay. Um, here's Elon Pape, the goat, writing an article called The Collapse of Zionism. Now, Elon Pape has talked about this quite a bit. As a matter of fact, even before this article, I'm going to start it off with a video. Shouts out to Emma, who actually sent me this video a while back. Said you should probably watch this. Wait. Did she text it to me or did she send it to me via DMs? Maybe she texted it to me. I'm a Vigland, yes. Am I imagining this? Did she not send me this Elon Pape video? Oh, she did. It was a Democracy Now! video, but she texted it to me. Hold up. Rizara Phantom Skibbity Tax Gia. The GDF vid would be a great follow up to Pape. Okay. Yes, we love Emma Vigland. She's dope. Emma and I maintain the uh emma and i are are basically uh, defending the integrity of of former tyt former tyt personnel that did not leavers of tyt that did not become clinically insane okay there are i wish i could say there are dozens of us but i can't the numbers the numbers they're not looking too good it's not on our side we have a couple of us out there okay not just levers. Okay, fair. And Eclipse is another one. You know, carrying that torch. There's a, there's a couple good... I mean, Ryan Grimm technically also worked at TYT for a, for a period of time. He's a good one. There's a couple of us out there. Jessica Burbank is another one. She was at TYT for a little bit. We got, we got these... Okay, you know what? There are, a, there are dozens of us. <laughs> there are dozens of us. The problem is it's like very high profile when, when people are, uh, you know, insane and leave TYT, they become Dave Rubin or Jimmy Dore. So it's like hard to make this argument, but there are dozens of us. Here's Elon Pape. I'm going to start off with this video first from a while ago on uh, Democracy Now. Uh, here, he, here he is talking like this is months ago too. This is May 21st, 2021. What gives me hope is that I do think that the Zionist project in Israel and Palestine, as we see today, doesn't have long to live, to exist. I think we are seeing processes, important processes, that are leading to the collapse of the Zionist project. Hopefully, the Palestinians... Did you ever get to meet Mark Thompson? Yeah, of course. Any, any TYT personnel that, uh, that was there before my time, uh, I have met, of course. Mark Thompson. Beautiful voice. Cool guy. He hosted the Guinness World Workers primetime show on Fox in 2000 and would fill in for Jank in the early TYT days. Yeah, I know all the old, the OG. I know all the OGs. I think John is still the sane one. Yeah. Yeah. John Iderola is cool. He, he has stayed strong and resilient. The national movement and anyone else involved in Israel and Palestine would be able to replace this apartheid state, this oppressive regime with a democratic one for everyone who lives between the river and the sea, and for all the Palestinians who were expelled from there since 1948 until today. I believe that this historical process has begun. Unfortunately, it will take time, and the next year or two are very precarious and are very dangerous. But in the long run, I, I'm re really hopeful that uh, there will be a different kind of life for both Jews and Arabs between the river and the sea under a democratic free Palestine. What gives me so that's the short and sweet of it but here is the collapse of zionism by elon pape i'm gonna give you like uh you know a really good i'm gonna i'm gonna read some of this okay elon pape is an israeli jewish historian a scholar academic uh he is an award-winning uh college professor his work was phenomenally important uh as far as the the new historians goes um he is he's great he's a wonderful person uh he is now i believe at exeter university he left israel um used to be a professor at uh was it tel was it tel aviv U or is one of the university maybe in haifa i forget where he was a professor in israel first but 
him and uh some of his uh research assistants him and some of his students uh were very important in uh uncovering uh truths about the nakba obviously but uh regardless this is an article he wrote on newleftreview.org collapse of zionism where he starts off with these words hamas's assault on october 7 can be likened to an earthquake that strikes an old building the cracks were already beginning the show, but, there are n but they are now visible in its very foundations. More than 120 years since its inception, could the Zionist project in Palestine, the idea of imposing a Jewish state on an Arab, Muslim, and Middle Eastern country, be facing the prospect of collapse? Historically, a plethora of factors can cause a state to capsize. It can result from constant attacks by neighboring countries or from chronic civil war. It can follow the breakdown of public institutions, which become incapable of providing services to its citizens often it begins as a slow process of disintegration that gathers momentum and then in a short period of time brings down structures that once appeared stolid and steadfast the difficulty lies in spotting the early indicators here i will argue that these are clearer than ever in the case of israel we are witnessing a historical process or more accurately the beginnings of one that is likely to culminate in the downfall of zionism i agree with this 100 percent and if my diagnosis is correct, then we are also entering a particularly dangerous conjecture. I also agree with this part as well. For once Israel realizes the magnitude of the crisis, it will unleash a ferocious and uninhibited force to try to contain it, as did the South African apartheid regime during its final days. A first indicator is the fracturing of Israeli Jewish society. At present, it is composed of two rival camps which are unable to find common ground. The rift stems from the anomalies of defining Judaism as nationalism. While Jewish identity in Israel is sometimes seems a little bit more than a subject of a theoretical debate between religious and secular factions, it has now become a struggle over the character of the public sphere and the state itself. This being fought not only in the media, but also in the streets. One camp can be termed the state of Israel. It comprises more secular, liberal, and mostly but not exclusively middle-class European Jews and their descendants who were instrumental in establishing the state in 1948 and remained hegemonic within it until the end of the last century. Make no mistake, their advocacy of liberal democratic values does not affect their commitment to the apartheid system which is imposed in various ways. Why is my grandmother calling me? Okay which is imposed in various ways on all Palestinians living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Their basic wish is for Jewish citizens to live in a democratic and pluralist society from which Arabs are included. So the argument is the exact same. No, she, she gave me a one second call and then uh, hung up. Okay, liberal Zionism all the way to the religious ultra-nationalist Zionism. Okay. Liberal Zionism in, uh, that, that is oxymoronic inherently because Zionism is a fascist ideology, is an ethno-nationalist project, agrees on the principles of maintaining an apartheid regime where Arabs are excluded, not included. I read it wrong. The other camp is the state of Judea, which developed among the settlers of the occupied West Bank. It enjoys increasing levels of support within the country and constitutes the electoral base that secured Netanyahu's victory in the November 2022 elections, its influence in the upper echelons of the Israeli army and security services is growing exponentially. The state of Judea wants Israel to become a theocracy that stretches over the entirety of historical Palestine. To achieve this, it is determined to reduce the number of Palestinians to a bare minimum. And it is contemplating the construction of a third temple in place of Al-Aqsa. The Red Cow Brigade, okay? The Winnie the Moo Enjoyers. Its members believe this will enable them to renew the golden era of the biblical kingdoms. For them, secular Jews are as heretical as the Palestinians if they refuse to join in this endeavor. Now, that's a, a major plank of fascist movements. You become increasingly more reactionary. You need to maintain a base of more and more psychopathic, more rabid fans. And when you do that, when you do that, Obviously, uh, you have to convert the rest of society uh, to your project. This is why fascism is inherently a death cult. It is a suicidal ideology. You try to expand the in-group, and if people don't become more fascist, okay, then ultimately, ultimately, Picture this. they will be a part of the out-group as well.
This causes a rift, a rift that has already revealed itself in the Supreme Court protest that happened in Israel a couple years ago. Okay? Just like the rift at the top of the hour at the Hassan Abi broadcast, where those who are unsubscribed will see a three minute ad break. Okay? Those who are subscribed, on the other hand, will not. This causes a major rift, which is why we always say, you know, gift subs, a privileged in group of subscribers, never seeing ads at the top of the hour, having link privileges. These are important parts of the Hassan Abu broadcast that causes a massive classes rift. Here's the three minute ad break now. The two camps had begun to clash violently before October 7. For the first few weeks after the assault, they appeared to shelve their differences in the face of a common enemy, but this was an illusion. The street fighting has reignited, and it is difficult to see what could possibly bring about reconciliation. The more likely outcome is already unfolding before our eyes. Miss Bunky, or Miss Susie B, thank you for the five gifted subs. A similar rift can be seen in the United States of America, okay? The right-wing party consistently shifts this country further and further right, eroding your civil liberties. Even if you are a liberal who personally is invested in the project of American dominance globally, and you want to defend that unconditionally and vociferously, you have to recognize that this country is becoming more and more right-wing, and Israel is doing that as well. Many other European liberal democracies are also engaging in their own version of this right-wing shift. The Western world, the hegemonic superpower, the, the collective liberal democracy, that project is coming to a close. Less than 100, oh, well, nearing the 100-year mark, the project is coming to an end. Fascism is going to kick back in to maintain order in the economic instability and the volatility that an endless profit-seeking attitude creates, okay? Yeah, empire abroad, empire at home is right. What, you know, what, what goes around comes around? Is that the term? Okay. This is a political project that the Arab world and perhaps even the world at large will not tolerate in the long term. The second indicator is Israel's economic crisis. The political class does not seem to have any plan for balancing the public finances amid perpetual armed conflicts beyond becoming increasingly reliant on American financial aid. In the final quarter of last year, the economy slumped by nearly 20%. Since then, the recovery has been fragile. Washington's pledge of $14 billion is unlikely to reserve this. On the contrary, the economic burden will only worsen if Israel follows through on its intention to go to war with Hezbollah while ramping up military activity in the West Bank at a time when some countries, including Turkey and Colombia, have begun to apply economic sanctions. The crisis is further aggregated, aggravated by the incompetence of the finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, who constantly channels money to Jewish settlements in the West Bank, but seems otherwise unable to run his department. The conflict between the state of Israel and the state of Judea, along with the events of October 7, is meanwhile causing some of the economic and financial elite to move their capital outside the state. Those who are considering relocating their investments make up a significant part of the 20% of Israelis who pay 80% of the taxes. A third indicator is Israel's growing international isolation. This is very important, as it gradually becomes a pariah state. This process began before October 7. I would say it ramped up in 2021, when all of the NGOs collectively in, in unison opened their eyes to the realities of the Israeli apartheid and called it what it was, an apartheid regime, a settler colonial apartheid regime, which it was for 75 years, 76 years now. At the time, for what, I don't, 2021 is when it happened. I'm not very good at math, okay? Not good at quick maths. The unprecedented positions adopted by the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court is reflected in this pariah status. Previously, the global Palestine solidarity movement was able to galvanize people to participate in boycott initiatives, yet it, is, yet it failed to advance the prospect of international sanctions. In most countries, support for Israel remained unshakable among the political and economic establishment. In this context, the recent ICJ and ICC decisions that Israel may be committing genocide, that it must halt its offensive in Rafah, that its leader should be arrested for war crimes must be seen as an attempt to heed the views of global civil society, as opposed to merely reflecting elite opinion. 
The tribunals have not eased the brutal attacks on the people of Gaza and the West Bank, but they have contributed to the growing chorus of criticism leveled at the Israeli state, which increasingly comes from above as well as below. The fourth interconnected indicator is the sea change among young Jews around the world. Following the events of the last nine months, many now seem willing to jettison their connection to Israel and Zionism. Shouts out to the Jewish Hassanabi heads, uh, both living in Israel and also in the Western world. They actively participate in the Palestinian solidarity movement. They, uh, they, they openly state that they do not have allegiances to the Zionist project nor the state of Israel. Jewish communities, particularly in the U.S., once provided Israel with effective immunity against criticism. The loss, or at least the partial loss of this support, has major implications for the country's global standing. APAC can still rely on Christian Zionists to provide assistance and shore up its membership. But... It will not be the same formidable organization without a significant Jewish constituency. The power of the lobby is eroding. Now, this part I don't fully agree with because I do think, as I've said before, um, winning the support over young American Jews, uh, especially like more and more young American Jews being open-minded and, and genuinely criticizing Israel, not like hating Benjamin Netanyahu, not the liberal Zionist positions, but like straight up, uh, criticizing the fundamental underpinnings of Israeli society, the national project, um, that, uh, that, that, like, seeing Zionism as a, as a fascist ideology, that in and of itself, that in and of itself is definitely, definitely good for the movement overall, for the pro-Palestinian solidarity movement overall, even though I still do believe that uh, as long as the calculation is that Israel has to be our unsinkable military base, it will be very difficult to get the American State Department to change course on the matter. The fifth indicator is the weakness of the Israeli army. There is no doubt that the IDF remains a powerful force with cutting-edge weaponry at its disposal, yet its limitations were exposed on October 7. Many Israelis feel that the military was extremely fortunate as the situation could have been far worse had Hezbollah joined in a coordinated assault. Since then... Israel has shown that it is desperately reliant on a regional coalition led by the U.S. to defend itself against Iran, whose warning attack in April saw the deployment of around 170 drones plus ballistic and guided missiles. More than ever, the Zionist project depends on the rapid delivery of huge quantities of supplies from the Americans, without which it could not even fight a small guerrilla army in the south. Has Turkey sanctioned Israel? Yes. Technically, Turkey has sanctioned Israel um, but it does not matter because uh, Turkey still provides damn near the entirety of the energy grid that Israel relies on. Uh, Turkish pipelines coming from Azerbaijan and Turkish steel plays a fundamental role in, in you know, Israeli industry. So <clears throat> Turkey or the Turkish government waning in its popularity has to obviously take initiatives that make it seem like they're trying to separate themselves from Israel, uh, politically, economically, but ultimately, I don't believe, uh, I don't know if they will uh, genuinely do this. I have said this before. I think that they will probably use trade partners to overcome the, the sanctions that they've supposedly put on Israel. Um, I said this before. I think that they will either use Azerbaijan or maybe some people are saying Greece. I don't think that that is, that, that seems a little crazy, but who knows? Um, well, I hate to be right all the time. Here's Turkish Minute. Turkish exporters circumvent trade ban with Israel via Greece. I thought that they would have used Azerbaijan. Turns out they're using Greece. There you go. If you recall, I said this the moment that the sanctions came out. Turkey is a NATO nation. Turkey will not rock the boat. Always trust that Turkey, the Turkish government at least, will have... America's best interest in mind will do what America wants it to do. Do you understand? Turkey will always do what America wants it to do. There are nuclear bases. There are nuclear bases in Turkey. There is no shot that Turkey would just turn around and fucking betray American State Department interests as long as they communicate that they have an endless desire to support Israel, no matter how brutal Israel gets. I don't think they will always do what Americans want to do. When, when push comes to shove, 
Turkey will always do what America wants it to do. It's not that they're just buddies, okay? The entire Turkish deep state apparatus, the entire Turkish government, the current Turkish leadership is directly, directly a, uh, from a cult that uh, was religious fundamentalist and a populist right-wing conservative neoliberal administration that came into power with NATO and with American involvement in Turkish domestic affairs. Okay, Fethullah Gülen is also a part of said cult. Now, Fethullah Gülen and Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Fethullah Gülen is the, the Turkish cleric, the Muslim cleric that lives in the Poconos and is a CIA asset. But um, while they have this rift now between Erdogan, oh, obviously, um, ultimately, Turkish politics is, is, Turkish politics is whatever America wants Turkey to do. Let's be real, okay? <clears throat> Let's continue. There is now a widespread perception of Israel's unpreparedness and inability to defend itself among the country's Jewish population. It has led to a major pressure to remove military exemption for ultra-Orthodox Jews. I can't believe Time Without an Owo is not here. This is like his favorite thing to cover, his favorite thing to report on, which is the Haredi enlistment drama, which he personally believes will, <laughs> will potentially disband the government. Um, but yes, um, our... our our uh, uh, Jewish-Israeli uh, chatter is not in here uh, to, to, while I'm reading this, but this is what he talks about all the time. He's not wrong on that. It's very funny. Yeah, the, uh, Haredi, the Haredi exemption has long been a point of contention. Uh, why the f*** don't they have to serve in the military? It's something that people are frustrated by. Now it's gotten to a boiling point. This has been in place since 1948. <laughs> the... It has led to a major pressure to remove the military exemption for ultra-Orthodox Jews in place since 1948 and begin drafting them in their thousands. This will hardly make much difference on the battlefield, but it reflects the scale of pessimism about the army, which has, in turn, deepened the political divisions within Israel. Watch Dante's stream, says Transbian Winter. You want me to turn around and watch a league streamer while I'm in the process of reading one of the foremost Israeli scholars and his analysis on how contemporary Israeli politics has reached a boiling point and that the Zionist project might actually come to an end. That is probably one of the worst suggestions I've ever heard in this entire chat. And there are a sea of awful, awful suggestions. Are these anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox? Some anti-Zionists are ultra-Orthodox, the Netroi Karta being one of the more famous ones, but... A lot of ultra-Orthodox Jews are not anti-Zionist, both in Israel and also outside of Israel. Anyway, let's continue. W is drama content. Okay, you're going to take a day off, trans be in winter, uh, and, and recollect. Okay? And be excited that I didn't give you a week off. The final indicator is the renewable energy among the younger generation of Palestinians. It is far more united, organically connected, and clear about its prospect than the Palestinian political elite. Given the population of Gaza and the West Bank is among the youngest of the world, this new cohort will have an immense influence over the course of liberation struggle. The discussions taking place among young Palestinian groups show that they are preoccupied with establishing a genuinely democratic organization, either a renewed PLO or a new one altogether that will pursue a vision of emancipation that is antithetical to Palestinian Authority's campaign for recognition as a state. They seem to favor a one-state solution to a discredited two-state model. This is also very big. The two-state model is basically at this stage a holdout. Like, it's, uh, it's the old guard. You still hear about it from the American government. That's, uh, that should give you an indication of like how outdated it is. And the reason for why many young Palestinians and many young people and even people like myself, people who used to be two-staters, myself included, uh, people like Avi Shlaim, people like Ilan Pape, the reason why they have moved away from the two-state solution and see the only solution as a uh, one-state solution is because they recognize that the Israeli settlement project is or has created through the process of the so-called peace process uh, a functional one state a one state that is an apartheid state 
Will they be able to mount an effective response to the decline of Zionism? This is a difficult question to answer. The collapse of a state project is not always followed by a brighter alternative. Elsewhere in the Middle East, in Syria, Yemen, and Libya, we have seen how bloody and protracted the results can be. In this case, it would uh, be a matter of decolonialization, and the previous century has shown that post-colonial realities do not always improve the colonial condition. I love you, dude, but I'm a young Palestinian, and I think this is a bad take, dude. No one in Palestine talks about it once they to lose it. All the all we talk about is liberation. Yes. Okay. What is? What do you mean? What do you think liberation is? We're not talking about simply liberation. We're talking about the day after. That's not even true. Polls show Palestinians favor a one-state solution because of West Bank settlements. No, I mean, depending on what poll you're looking at, there are definitely, there are um, definitely uh, plenty of polls that show Palestinians want a two-state solution. I think ultimately, though, and I agree with this assessment at least, I don't give a shit what it's called, okay? That's why in the immediate, in the immediate term, I want a ceasefire. In the short term, I don't care if there is a, a two-state with the, with the end goal being a one-state. I don't mind any kind of initiative in the right direction that provides a little bit of breathing room for the Palestinians, okay? Also, as a political commentator who is relatively knowledgeable about Israel-Palestine history, and, and this includes like my opinions that might even be different than the differing than the, the, the you know average Palestinian or whatever. I personally am a, a firm and committed believer in the one state solution because I think that is both just and that is the best way forward. Yeah, my opinions might not always completely align with other people's, but it doesn't matter. As an American, I see the allure, but I'm just telling you, people in Palestine can't just see a unified secular state, nor would want it. It feels more like a Western intellectual idea, which I happen to agree with. I just think it's worth grounding ourselves with the people in Palestine. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't necessarily, first of all, I don't think you speak for the entirety of the Palestinian movement regardless. But even if you were, it still wouldn't change my position on the matter. Like, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. Like, people always say, uh, why would you want to live with people who are genociding you while laughing and joking? Yeah. That is ultimately the same. I think this is more of an outsider's opinion. This is more of the uh, of an outsider's opinion than anyone else's opinion. I feel like this is more of a Western leftist take than anyone else. Okay, because history is riddled, riddled with people who now live alongside their historic oppressors. Okay, and that struggle is long. And that struggle does not always yield perfect emancipation nor equality, but it doesn't matter. It's still a genuine improvement, okay? Hey, Palestinian here, a va uh, mass vast majority of us recognize the two-state is not possible or sustainable, and the current Israeli government structure will never allow an equal Palestinian state to exist. And as far as, and as, far as like, what the, what the Palestinian uh, approach is, what the Palestinian approach is in the, uh, or, or the Palestinian opinion is about, like, driving out every Israeli, it doesn't matter. That is not a realistic solution and it's not going to happen regardless. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say that's a good solution. Ultimately, you can say that I'm wrong about it, but like, it's just one, not going to ever happen. And two, and that's not defeatist thinking. I wouldn't even consider that to be a good thing in general. I think that, you know, there are millions of people living there. They can learn to live with Palestinians side by side in a secular state and that should be the goal ultimately especially because i see the the current situation as a one state where israel is simply occupying the lands and the palestinian people okay anyway um yeah we got the al jazeera uh, biden's uh, involvement in israel documentary coming up after this anyway <clears throat> Only the agencies of, of the Palestinians can move us in the right direction. I believe that sooner or later, an explosive fusion of these indicators will result in the destruction of the Zionist project in Palestine. When it does, we must hope that a robust liberation movement is there to fill the void. For more than 56 years, what was termed the peace process, a process that led nowhere, was actually a series of American-Israeli initiatives to which the Palestinians were asked to react. Today, peace must be replaced with decolonialization, and Palestinians must be able to articulate their vision for the region with Israelis asked to react. This would mark the first time, at least for many decades, that the Palestinian movement would not take, would take the lead in setting out its proposal for a post-colonial and non-Zionist Palestine, or whatever the new entity will be called. In doing so, it will look to Europe, perhaps to the Swiss cantons and the Belgian model, or more aptly, the old structures of the Eastern Mediterranean, 
where secularized religious groups morphed gradually into ethnocultural ones that lived side by side in the same territory. Black people live in America, Rwanda reconciliation, Ethiopia reconciliation, Liberia reconciliation, the 1950s EU agreement between France and Germany. The idea that there's no coming back is ahistorical and honestly thinking like a reactionary nationalist. I agree. You're absolutely correct on that. That is my assessment as well as something that I regularly point to. White European colonies and white European monarchs have warred for hundreds of years. Now, you never even consider a reality where any of these EU nations would go to war against one another. You take the peace that you foresee, that you experience, that you recognize. You take the freedom of movement in the Europe, in the European continent, for granted. Okay? Don't say, well, for now, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, we... As social animals want peace and collaboration more than what we want war, okay? We are not like inherently interested in being violent to one another if peace is an alternative. And there is no better indication of this than the current conditions in Europe. These were literally, they were cousin that killed each other and ruthlessly slaughtered one another over and over again for hundreds of years, okay? For a much longer time than they actually were cooperating and collaborating with one another. And yet, because of our horse blinders, because of our short-term thinking, we literally take the current peace for granted and think that that is the normal way of existence, in Europe at least. We cannot extend that. Or in Ireland versus England. In Ireland and Northern Ireland. Like, which will be united in our lifetime, inshallah. But uh, my point is... My point is that wasn't even that long ago. The apartheid South Africa was not that long ago. Okay. <clears throat> what should be done with the Zionist settlers? Why should Palestinians be forced to live with Israelis when over 90% of them agree with the genocide? Black people in South Africa still face overwhelming land ownership and economic disparities despite the fall of apartheid due to the colonial policies. Seems like the colonizers should not stay in the lands they stole. Yes, this is pure fantasy, and it comes across like, like a really good moral foundation that you have here. The reality is that uh, the economic apartheid stayed in place in South Africa. That was a major f***ing L. Having said that, however, conditions are dramatically better in comparison to apartheid South Africa regardless. That is a separate problem to solve. As far as, as far as like purging the Israeli Zionists, that's ridiculous. The real solution is actual reconstruction and not the one that happened in the United States of America that failed as a project because those in positions of power actually wanted to maintain the racial pecking order and immediately cap uh, capitulated to pathic, uh, pathic, violent, abid, racist, white supremacists in the South. Okay? Did you say cousin? Yes, I did. When referencing, yes, when referencing European kings and queens, I said cousin because that is precisely what they are. They were cousins with one another and they fucked each other. Sometimes sister. Anyway, yeah, no one looks at South Africa and thinks they should turn back because it didn't work. That there is more progress to go is just proof Francis Fukuyama war, uh, view of an end of the history is naive. End of the uh, history is naive. Yes. Anyway, let's continue. Whether people welcome the idea or dread it, the collapse of Israel has become foreseeable. This possibility should inform the long-term conversation about the region's future. It will be forced onto the agenda as people realize that the century-long attempt, led by Britain and then the U.S., to impose a Jewish state on an Arab country is slowly coming to an end. It was successful enough to create a society of millions of settlers, many of them now second and third generation, but their presence still depends, as it did when they arrived, on their ability to violently impose their will on millions of indigenous people who have never given up their struggle for self-determination and freedom in their homeland. In the decades to come, the settlers will have to part with this approach and show their willingness to live as equal citizens in a liberated and decolonized Palestine. This is probably the most important part of it. Okay? <sighs> What will happen if they can't? We'll see. What I think realistically, if this were to happen, 
if this were to happen, if Palestine were to be decolonized and liberated, I think that it would reflect post-abolition Southern conditions where, um, depending on who the operating authority is in the region, why were you okay when Drake was kicked out of Georgia back to Toronto for not being a colonizer? Not being a colleague, but a colonizer? You're right. Because I'm, hip I'm a hypocrite. That's a good one, Oliver. As Rashid Khalidi said, the most important step to liberating the Palestinians is overcoming the myth of the conflict in the first place, which can be our role as leftists in the U.S. Yes. What people don't... Uh, what I foresee... What I foresee in this situation... What I foresee in this situation is a shit ton of violence. Okay? Fascists famously do not let go of their prior considerations, their prior mode of existence, their, their ultra-nationalist project without some kind of force. And even after they lose, they're sore losers, okay? Even after they lose, they're oftentimes sore f losers. There's a balance, though. There's a balance that must be struck. It's not about vengeance. It's about justice, okay? And I think that that reconstruction... Uh, period will have a shit ton of error, mostly from the ultra nationalist Zionists that refuse to change, and even some from the Palestinians who are seeking out vengeance. Okay, for sure. The difference, however, is that that should be prosecuted. That should be prosecuted as civil matters. Okay, that's the point. Just like currently. One major problem with Palestinian terror is that it is seen as an outside group engaging in acts of terror inside of Israel, whereas it is a resistance against an apartheid structure, and technically these are people that the Israeli government has sovereignty over, whether they like it or not. All of these matters should be handled, and if they were handled as though they were, uh, you know, like civil, civil matters that have to be handled in the civil court structure instead of war, it would not look like ethnic cleansing because ethnic cleansing is when a belligerent occupier treats the entire population that it currently occupies as enemy combatants. That's just, it just, you know, looks like ethnic cleansing on paper. It walks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. It's a duck. That's why I say Israel does not have a right to defend itself under international humanitarian law as a belligerent occupier over the Gazan territory as well as the West Bank. Yep, Israel is a natural occurring state that just happens to be surrounded by anti-Semitic terrorists. <laughs> I mean, that is what people think, which is so crazy. Anyway, that was Ilan Pape. We have a uh, we have a, a, a GDF video that came out apparently as well. Debunking the state of Israel. That's such a funny, a, a funny title for the video, but let's see. And then we'll move on. A reading from the book of Joshua. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spake unto Joshua. Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Forty thousand prepared for war, went before the Lord unto battle, into ye plain of Jericho. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. Ass. They burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. The book of Joshua is required reading in Israeli schools today. The book holds an important place because in its pages many people think that a precedent can be found for the establishment of Israel as a nation. The book of Joshua provided the muscular and militaristic dimension of conquest and the annihilation of the Canaanites and other ancient peoples that populated the promised land. Hi, my name is GDF, and you can probably tell by the direction that this video is going in that I'm not very advertiser friendly. For that reason, I rely completely on my patrons, <coughs> subscribers, and donations. Following the creation of the State of Israel, biblical archaeology became an obsession. Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, was, as were almost all of the earliest contemporary Zionists, 
an atheist. Again, very Hitlerian. Okay, Zionism being a fascist ideology, desperately looking for a uh, national mythos and national myth-making is damn near identical to all of the other esoteric Nazi mythologies that, that Adolf Hitler engaged in. Many archaeological expeditions to overcome the recent history at the time of Germany being like, you know, a bunch of dudes living in the fucking forest inside of mud huts and overcoming that L that Hitler perceived it as and trying to recreate like a, like a different, more prosperous, more prosperous national myth. Although many early Jewish Zionists were secular, socialists, and atheists, the biblical narrative was an appealing way of legitimizing the Zionist movement. Upon assuming his role as first premier, cementing his legacy as Israel's founding father, Ben-Gurion organized Bible study classes in his official residence, and was instrumental in making the study of the Book of Joshua a major component of the school curriculum in Israel. It was this atheist socialist Ben-Gurion who declared to the Peel Commission in 1936 that the Bible is our mandate, and was later quoted as declaring, Though I reject theology, the single most important book in my life is the Bible. Using a nationalist interpretation, the Bible came to become a course material. I respect biblical archaeology and archaeology in general. Piecing together an accurate portrayal of history is important, but even religious scholars tend to exaggerate any findings. Archaeology should be devoid of any kind of additional bias. Okay? The goal should be to uncover truths about the past. The goal should not be to uncover things from the past with the specific purpose of creating a national mythos, okay? That's the major difference here. That's why I'm saying this is like quite Hitlerian in nature because this is exactly a shortcoming that Hitler had as well, among many others, obviously. Like trying to engage in confirmation bias of a 3,000 year old project that is finally coming to a close uh, by going in and finding like old coins and being like, see, this is why we have to do genocide to the current indigenous population on the land is completely ridiculous. And it goes against the very scientific foundations of archaeology. Okay. It is no different than like trying to find and investigate Santa Claus or um, like the many archaeological expeditions that Nazi Germany went on in an effort to create a, a different national mythos for, for the Nazi project. Look, let's go to my favorite Wikipedia, my favorite page, Wikipedia, okay? Nazi archaeology. Nazi archaeology was a field of pseudo-archaeology led and encouraged by various Nazi leaders and Anarebe Anen, okay, whatever, SS figures, I'm not going to be able to say that correctly, such as Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler which directed archaeologists and other scholars to search Germany's archaeological past in order to find material evidence supporting an advanced Aryan ancestry as alleged and espoused by the ultra-nationalist Nazi party. The search for a strong nationalistic Aryan-centric national prehistory of Germany began after Germany's loss in World War I in 1918, in which during this time the country faced severe economic crisis due to the terms brought on by the Treaty of Versailles. One of the leading experts who engaged in research and study in search of the German prehistory was German uh, philologist and archaeologist Gustav Kosina, with his ideas and theories being picked up and further researched by Nazi organizations Amt Rosenberg and Ahnenerbe. 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 I think I said it right. With specialization in researching German prehistory, as well as Hitler being able to provide funds from the Nazi party to study German prehistory. Ahnenerbe. The Nazis were able to add pseudo-archaeology into its extensive propaganda campaigns of the German people, presenting Germany as the beginnings of civilization. The main goals of the organization, Adenerbe, formerly the Deutsches Adenerbe Student Geisteschichte, was an organization started by the Research Institute of Prehistory of Mind and was connected to the SS in 1935 by Walter Dare. In 1936, it was attached to Hitler's Reichsführer SS, led by the chief of police Heinrich Himmler. 
By 1937, it was the primary instrument of Nazi archaeology and archaeological propaganda, subsuming smaller organizations like the Reinhardt Archaeology Group and filling its ranks with investigators. To study the territory ideas and achievements of the Indo-Germanic people, to bring the research findings to life and present them to the German people, to encourage every German to get involved in the organization. Some of their most extravagant activities include Edmund Kies tried to travel to Bolivia in 1928 to study the ruin, ruins of temples in the Andes Mountains. He claimed their similarity to ancient European construction indicated they were designed by Nordic migrants that had arrived at the area millions of years earlier. In 1938, Franz Altheim and his research partner Erika Trautmann requested the Ananerbe sponsors a Middle Eastern trek to study an internal power struggle of the Roman Empire, which they believed was fought between the Nordic and Semitic peoples. In 1936, Ananerbe expedition visited the German island of Rügen and Sweden with the objective of examining, uh, examining rock art, which they concluded was proto-Germanic. Nazi theorists took a huge interest in the Bayou Tapestry, going so far as to attempt archaeological digs to find other contemporary artwork that would support their assertion of Germanic might. In 1938, the Ananerbe sent an expedition to Tibet with the intention of proving Aryan superiority by confirming the Vril theory, which was based on Edward Bulwer Lytton's book, Vril, The Power of the Coming Race. Their study included measuring the skulls of 376 people and comparing native feature to those associated with Aryans, with the expedition's most scientific findings uh, being associated with biological findings. Why am I talking about this? Obviously, like, Israeli archaeology doesn't extend to this degree, but their hyper-obsession with, uh, like, the energy is still there, okay? The energy is still there, because the ultimate goal is to make a nationalistic mythos stick okay let's continue material taught as immutable fact to school children the bible came to serve as the first history book to be studied by all school children within the zionist community in palestine as well as under the auspices of the israeli education system You've within the modern state of israel as well as being taken for granted by the scientific community and academia generally from a collection of theological texts incorporating historical plots and divine miracles aimed at inculcating faith in its readers, it became a compilation of historiographic texts that bore only a smattering of optional religious meaning. So ingrained was the Bible in schooling by 1992 that Benjamin Beit Halachmi, professor of psychology at the University of Haifa, could write, Most Israelis today, as a result of Israeli education, regard the Bible as a source of reliable uh -huh. historic information of a secular, political kind. And it remained that way even into the 21st century, to the point that, under no circumstances is it permissible to skip over the book of Joshua. Moreover, even though the teaching of this past has been proven ethically and pedagogically destructive, the Israeli education system refuses to exclude from the curriculum by the way, uh, to further prove that like Israel utilizes archaeology, even archaeology, which is objectively good. I'm not saying I'm anti-archaeology at all. Please do not misunderstand me. There are obviously Israeli scholars and archaeologists who aren't fucking freaks. Um, they use it as a as a mechanism of terror, not just to like propagandize this three thousand year uh, you know uh, national myth making, but literally as an offensive act of terror, they are currently digging under the Al-Aqsa Mosque so thoroughly under the auspices of an archaeological dig with the ultimate goal of making the foundation so pure that the Al-Aqsa Mosque collapses. Okay? So, like, it is fucking insane. It is so gross. These shameful accounts of extermination. After all, David Ben-Gurion had repeatedly invoked the Book of Joshua to justify the massacres and ensuing ethnic cleansing carried out under the guise of the 1948 war. But even before 1948, the excavation of Palestine was underway during the mandatory period starting in 1917. Indeed, under British control, the first archaeological crusader seeking to dig up the Holy Land as told by the Bible 
was none other than the American William Foxwell Albright. His legacy as one of the most influential biblical scholars of the 20th century makes his worldview all the more disturbing. As a fundamentalist, Albright did not doubt stories like the Book of Joshua, and even justified them. In those days, warfare was total, and we Americans have perhaps less right than most modern nations to sit in judgment on the Israelites of the 13th century BC, since we have, intentionally or otherwise, exterminated scores of thousands of Indians in every corner of our great nation and have crowded the rest into great concentration camps. It often seems necessary that a people of markedly inferior type should vanish before a people of superior potentialities, since there is a point beyond which racial mixture cannot go without disaster. Thus the Canaanites, with their orgiastic nature worship, their cult of fertility in the form of serpent symbols and sensuous nudity, and their gross mythology were replaced by Israel with its pastoral simplicity and purity of life, its lofty monotheism, and its severe code of ethics. In the words of revisionist biblical scholar Keith Whitelam of the University of Sterling, this justification by one of the great icons of 20th century biblical scholarship of the slaughter of the indigenous Palestinian population is remarkable for two reasons. It is an outpouring of undisguised racism which is staggering, but equally startling is the fact that this statement is never referred to or commented on, as far as I know, by biblical scholars in their assessments of the work of Albright. There's just one glaring problem with Foxwell's analysis, and further the foundational texts justifying the Zionist project and the creation of the State of Israel. It's all bullshit. <laughs> the slaughter as told in the book of Joshua never happened, and the stories of the Israelites in the Bible are not even remotely historically accurate. That's why it's so funny when fucking Brianna Poo was doing this shit, talking about like Moses parting the Red Sea as though it was a real historical event. It blew my mind. It's like, bro, you didn't even go to Bible school nor Hebrew school. Like, where did you develop this mentality over the course of the past month? Like, how? Like, if you were a child and this is all you heard, I'm a little bit more understanding of it, right? Like, that's social conditioning instilled upon you from such an early age when you were significantly more malleable. You have to have literally a baby's brain at your old ass age to watch October 7 unfold and then be negatively polarized against like this emancipatory movement, Palestinian emancipatory movement so severely that your brain shuts off and you're like a five-year-old to think this, okay? How does this happen? Former archaeologist here, when I was in grad school, I took an archaeology seminar course and we did a deep dive into Nazi and biblical archaeology and heavily discussed the dangers of these topics and how they're not real archaeology slash science. So yes, this topic is actively being taught. It's nuts, dude. Like, let's continue, right. sorry. It was 1999 when Zave Herzog, professor of archeology span at Tel Aviv University, who at one time was the director of their Institute of Archeology, span wrote a piece for the weekly Haaretz magazine titled, Deconstructing the Walls of Jericho. His words were difficult ones for biblical literalists. Following 70 years of intensive excavations in the land of Israel, archaeologists have found out the Israelites did not sojourn in Egypt, did not wander in the wilderness, did not conquer the land of Canaan in a military campaign, and did not pass it on to the 12 tribes of Israel. Additionally, as opposed to the long-held claim of a sovereign united kingdom of Israel, the united monarchy of David and Solomon, which was described in the Bible as a regional superpower, was, at most, a small tribal kingdom. Herzog describes the ascent of William Foxwell Albright in the 1920s, and later, following the establishment of the State of Israel, the founding fathers of Israeli archaeology, including Benjamin Mazar, Naaman Avigad, Yigal Yadin, and others. Herzog writes that using the Bible as a literal guide to exploring the Bronze and Iron Ages was standard practice from the beginning, which would continue for decades. However, writes Herzog, little by little cracks began to appear in the picture. To take one example, 
The story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, wandering for 40 years across the Sinai. Many Egyptian documents known to us do not mention at all the sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt or the later exodus of an entire people, which was curious considering the Egyptians kept highly detailed records which included even small incursions. Many documents mention the practice of wandering- Yeah, but I saw that fucking Disney flick and that shit was a banger. So guess what, dude? I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you're wrong. <laughs> Not even good fiction? No, it's great fiction. Come on. No, it is It is good fiction, but it is pretty fun. Uh, it was DreamWorks. It wasn't Disney. Sorry. It was DreamWorks. What was it? What was it? Was it Prince of Egypt? Is that what it was called? I don't know. It was a banger. It was good. It was good. It was sick. It's just that like, you know, it's a cartoon. It, it, you know, I, I, even as a child, when I was watching it, I never once considered like frogs fucking raining from the sky and like the firstborns getting, uh, you know, executed by getting murked by God. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Bring shepherds to enter Egyptian territory in times of drought or famine and to settle at the fringes of the Nile Delta. Or how about Mount Sinai? where Moses was to receive the Ten Commandments. Generations of researchers have tried to locate the site of Mount Sinai. <laughs> yeah, Aladdin literalists, exactly. Watching Aladdin and being like, yeah, no, the, the Arabs have uh, secret superpowers and genies, and also they can fly on carpets that are made of magic. Sinai and the encampments of the Israelite tribes in the wilderness. Despite the strenuous efforts, not even one site has been located that would accord with the biblical account. And of course, the historicity of the conquest, or rather genocide, of the Canaanites was especially problematic. Here, the most severe difficulties have arisen. The book of Joshua reveals that as the armed men approach Jericho, the city's walls miraculously collapse, ushering in the slaughter. But Kathleen Kenyon, the excavator of Jericho, established definite Denying Passover isn't anti-Semitic? Denying you the bait at the top of the hour is not anti-Semitic. Neither is talking about, like, biblical history as though it's fucking accurate. Like, pointing out the inaccuracies of biblical history is not anti-Semitic. That's ridiculous. Just like, just like denying you the opportunity to fucking debate me at the top of the hour, because this is some weak shit, okay? At the top of the hour, there is a... This actually happened. Oh God, what a banger this is. Okay, I love this. I love this cartoon. Um, at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe, uh, which you can do for $5 or free. Tree Moss, thank you for the five tier one gift of subs, allowing five people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. <laughs> it's not a cartoon, it's a documentary. Okay, fair. Here's the three minute ad break now. You who I call brother. How did you have come to hate me so? Is this what you wanted? Then let my heart be hardened, and never mind how high the cost may grow. This will still be so. I will never let your people go. you said that there's nothing wrong with having a belief i understand being an extremist is bad and trying to use your beliefs to influence politics is bad but you have many leftist christians muslims and jews in your chat yeah except there's never do you not understand the entire purpose of like biblical archaeology or or utilizing or weaponizing archaeology and the reasons as to why we're talking about historical accuracy in this circumstance like what do I always say? I say religious opinions or religious beliefs are perfectly fine as long as it is not being used to enforce your will upon others or to harm them. Zionism is a fascist project. What the fuck? What are we having? What, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, if archaeology is being utilized and, and religious text is being utilized as the underpinning for why this uh, fascist project must come to uh, must must come to a final solution, okay? Which is the the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous population living there. Then yeah, no, I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna uh, one. 
obviously mentioned that it doesn't even matter if all of this shit was true, okay? While also simultaneously tell you that it's, it's funny because it's not even true. All right, let's continue. ...that there is no support for the conjecture that Jer that's the That's the funniest part about this, by the way, is that, like, even if every single thing was correct, even if, like, this, all of the, the uh, archaeological discoveries proved that, like, you know, yes, no, this was, a, this was a collection of people and that, like, Moses did part the Red Sea and then fucking, uh, you know, uh, uh, walked around, roamed in the desert, yada, 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 all of this shit. None of it justifies Israel's ethnic cleansing. Like, that's ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous. Jericho was fortified with a city wall during the late Bronze Age. I'm a Muslim and I just say because Zionism is, uh, just because Zionism is wrong and evil doesn't mean the story of Moses and the children of Israel is not true. In reality, excavations at all the sites uncovered only unfortified settlements, while in many instances, the site held only isolated structures of the ruler's palace and no actual city. Urban culture in late Bronze Age Palestine was disintegrating in a process that lasted hundreds of years and was not the result of a military conquest. Herzog isn't revealing. Like, Christianity is perfectly fine. I love liberation theology. I will always defend it against r slash atheist dipshit. Like, if you come in here and you're like, no, you don't understand. Jesus literally walked on water and turned water into wine. I'm gonna be like, you're fucking insane. Okay? Like, that's insane. That did not happen. I'm sorry. That's a ridiculous claim to make. Okay? Like, you could be Christian all day, every day. It's great. But, like, that's a fucking ridiculous thing. Like, yeah, dude, no, magic existed. It's just we forgot. We lost sight of our godly ways, and it doesn't exist anymore. Like, that opens, that way of thinking opens up so many fucking avenues. Just look at it as, like, fun stories, okay, that uh, try to instill good lessons in a, in a way that uh, motivates you, that, that, that sets, like, principles for you. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to take it literally, okay? That's insane that big of a secret he writes these facts have been known for years but israel is a stubborn people and nobody wants to hear about it these issues and more were addressed by a colleague of herzog once again hold on uh there you go it's a documentary i didn't even realize there was a documentary of it as years, well see but israel is a stubborn people and nobody wants to hear about it these issues and more were addressed by a colleague of herzog at tel aviv university Emeritus Professor of History Shlomo Sand. In the 13th century BCE, the purported time of the Exodus, Canaan was ruled by the still powerful pharaohs. This means that Moses led the freed slaves out of Egypt to Egypt? Sand also took issue with the numbers. According to the biblical narrative, the people he led through the wilderness for 40 years included 600,000 warriors. They would have been traveling with their wives and children, implying a party of around 3 million in total. Aside from the fact that it was utterly impossible for a population of such size to wander through the desert. Sorry, that, that's a video. There's video evidence um, owned. ...for so long. An event of such magnitude should have left some epigraphic or archaeological traces. The ancient Egyptians kept meticulous records of every event, and there is a great deal of documentation about the kingdom's political and military life. There are even documents about incursions of nomadic groups into the realm. Yet there is not a single mention of any children of Israel who lived in Egypt or rebelled against it or emigrated from it at any time. There's also another more uncomfortable fact. History can be ironic. Few people have noticed or are willing to acknowledge that the land of Israel of biblical texts did not include Jerusalem, Hebron, Bethlehem, or their surrounding areas, but rather only Samaria and a number of adjacent areas. In other words, the land of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Because a United Kingdom encompassing both ancient Judea and Israel never existed, a unifying Hebrew name for such a territory never emerged. As a result, all biblical texts employed the same pharaonic name for the region, the land of Canaan, Israel, without Jerusalem. Indeed, the second book of Chronicles reveals with Israel once more intact, he returned to Jerusalem. Though claims to the city have been the source of so much strife and suffering, Jerusalem's significance historically, especially among the Zionist movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 
is tentative, as explained in a helpful article for the New York Review of Books by Avishai Margalit, professor emeritus of philosophy at Hebrew University. Margalit points out that the founding of Jerusalem predates Islam, Christianity, and in fact, Judaism itself. It is thought that Jerusalem was founded about 4,000 years ago as a city of ritual worship by the Canaanites. Jumping ahead thousands of years, Zionism had ambitions to create a new Jewish society, but Jerusalem was the least appropriate place for the founding of such a new society. Most of the Jerusalem Jews were part of an ultra-Orthodox community of the sort that the Zionists were rebelling against, a community that lived on donations and did not have the kind of productive life that the Zionist revolution aspired to. It is no wonder, then, that the Zionists preferred to build the new Hebrew city in the golden sands of Tel Aviv. Most of the immigrants to Israel, about 80%, settled along the Mediterranean coast, a region that had never been the historic homeland of the Jewish people. It appears this ambivalence is a historic trend. Unlike Christianity, Judaism does not regard the pilgrimage to Jerusalem as an act of penance for transgressions, or an act that can purify the believer, and we therefore find no recommendation that it be implemented. The data appear to illustrate this point further. We know of approximately 30 texts that provide accounts of Jewish pilgrimage during the 1700 years between 135 CE and the mid-19th century. By contrast, for the 1500 years between 333 CE and 1878, we have some 3,500 reports of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land. These words are at stark odds with the Israeli Proclamation of Independence issued at Tel Aviv on May 14, 1948. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people remained faithful to it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return. Exiled from their land is, of course, a reference to the story of the Roman Empire exiling Jews from their province of Judea. This foundational myth is the source of the theory that the Jewish diaspora the world over can trace their ancestry to Palestine. Therein lies their claim to the land and the reason why Jewish immigrants, wherever they may be, are said to be returning to their homeland when moving to Israel. Authoritative experts on Jewish history take issue with this theory, to put it plainly, not least of which being Israel Yuval, professor of Jewish history at Hebrew University. So are we saying that Israel has no history and they don't exist? Well, first of all, Israel has 76 years of rather violent colonial settler history, if that's what you're talking about. But the, the supposed... 3,000 years of, like, uh, national mythos that accompanies Zionism in and of itself, albeit is completely ridiculous to justify, once again, settler, colonial, apartheid actions, ethnic cleansing, and the like, and absolutely zero people would consider that to be valid. Um, but beyond that, uh, beyond the validity of uh, whether or not this is an appropriate argument to make, that matches the, the violent actions ultimately or justifies them, it doesn't have real basis in history. Yeah. Saying the Jews are native to Palestine is like believing the Mormons are right about making uh, America for the whites. Like, it is, it is a deliberate attempt made by oftentimes secular and atheist people, okay, like secular people who wanted to create some kind of historical underpinning uh, a, a national mythos. That's the reason why I made the comparison to the esoteric Nazi uh, archaeology movement, which, which also sought out that exact same principle to look for uh, a, a superior race narrative and, and fabricate claims like historical, um, you know, fabricate historical claims. I thought there were black Mormons. Now there are because they patched it. Back in the day, though, uh, being black meant that you had the mark of Cain. The only evil people that will never have their own planet were black people. It went through a couple different patch notes. From his The Myth of the Jewish Exile from the Land of Israel, the Romans, like any victorious army, customarily took prisoners, 
but they did not have a policy of exiling conquered nations from the their record, land. This doesn't mean that their Judaism was not invented there, okay? That's not what I'm saying at all. It's simply that it's simply that one major part of this conversation that people seemingly don't recognize, if you want to go all the way back to the Canaanites or whatever, is that the current state of Israel is literally murking their own fucking, uh, the, the, the surviving members of their own ancestors. Okay? Because over the course of thousands of fucking years, obviously things change. They do not have a historical claim as the rulers of the land. Exactly. It's ridiculous. You're just killing people who converted to first Christianity or, you know, killing people that immigrated just like Jewish people immigrated historically as well, but significantly more Christians immigrated at the time or uh, in that process, as GDF mentioned. Like, it's an important, it's an important land for uh, all three of the Abrahamic religions. A lot of Jewish people were native to Palestine. The ancestors of the Palestinians just converted over time from Judaism to Christianity or Islam. Judaism spread across Europe throughout the past 2,000 years. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Exactly. So the current Palestinian population that is under Israeli subjugation are historic descendants in many instances of the, the people that never just, the, the people that never left. <laughs> That's it. According to Josephus's probably inflated figures, 1.1 million were killed in Jerusalem and about 97,000 were captured. Many of these met their deaths in battles with animals and in circus entertainments others died of hunger. But otherwise, the Jews were left in place. They emigrated from the land of Israel during the first centuries of the first millennium in a slow and gradual process, and not as the result of an intentional policy on the part of the Roman and Byzantine authorities. The myth remained and was given credence when, in the fourth century, Orosius, reviewing the data found in Josephus regarding 90,000 Jews taken captive in Jerusalem, concluded that these prisoners, who, according to him, were scattered all over the world, were the founders of the Jewish diaspora in general. Tel Aviv University's Shlomo Sand further takes issue with Josephus's estimate of 97,000 captured. There was no such metropolis in the little kingdom of Judea. A cautious estimate suggests that Jerusalem at the time could have had a population of... Unfortunately, GDF is making a bad argument not based on accurate history. A better argument is just that historical origin of Judaism in the region doesn't mean shit. No, I 100% I agree with that. I, like, ultimate, the, the accuracy of... Uh, the, the accuracy or inaccuracy of all of these expeditions bears no weight on the current violence that the Israeli state is bringing about, okay? It's just so fucking stupid. It's just more so insult to it. I guess, like, this is more to just, like, dunk on people who try to... Dunk on people who try to personally make, like, this uh, ridiculous argument on top of it. But you don't have to engage in this at all. There is no world in which you can, like, trace your lineage back uh, however many thousands of years, okay? And, and, then, and then justify, like, current conquest, current colonial conquest. That's insane. The historical portions of the video aren't well-researched. Okay. There's historic remnants of Turks in Mongolia. Should we go and colonize Mongolia? Yeah, I mean, if that's the case, like, yeah, the, a big chunk of the planet as we understand it, uh, all the way to Europe, belongs to the Mongolians. Like, what are we talking about? The Golden Horde, baby, returns. Okay, give it back. Give it back now. Everyone is fucking Turkish. It's ironic because I joke about, like, the, uh, the, the Native American population, like, Turks believing that the Native American population uh, is, is uh, technically of, like, Turkic origin or whatever. And that's stupid as fuck. It's completely fucking idiotic. And I joke about it. I joke about it all the time because I think it's funny, except this literally is like trying to create a, uh, a, a basis, like a, like a legitimate argument as to why, no, you're not, you're wrong, actually. No, 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 no. Like Israel is the way it is because of all this. It's stupid. And it doesn't exist for anyone. Trying to, it is a desperate attempt and a silly attempt to, to try to turn what was objectively and openly colonial occupation 
in at the time of its foundation, at the time of like the Zionist movement growing and becoming legitimate, okay, it was openly colonial. Everyone understood it. Everyone said it. Everyone was like, this is great. They communicated with other other colonies and said, like, we're just like you. And yet now there is this like attempt to liberalize that by going back in history and being like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is a land back movement. It's stupid. That's not how anything works. 60,000 to 70,000 inhabitants, but most problematic of all. Yeah. If that's how it worked, if that's how it worked, then yeah. What do you mean? Ukraine? Yeah. You mean the border as in the border of greater Russia? Like, what are we talking about here? That's precisely the fucking argument that not only Dugan is make, but like Vladimir Putin directly made the Tucker Carlson. And that is closer in history than motherfucking Israel. That is literally a shorter time frame than the one, the, the 3,000 years of, of Jewish history that uh, Israel claims it is like uh, doing a land back movement over. Okay? It's ridiculous. Nowhere in the abundant Roman documentation is there any mention of a deportation from Judea, nor have any traces been found of large refugee populations around the borders of Judea after the uprising, as there would have been if a mass flight had taken place. Hebrew University's Avishai Margalit's views of the supposed exile are also worthy of attention. The claim that a Palestinian Arab descended from the early Jews is no less probable than that of, say, Menachem Begin or Golda Meir. In the popular and ahistoric version of Jewish history, the destruction of the Second Temple is linked with the exile from the land, but a considerable part, perhaps even a majority, of the Jewish people already lived in the diaspora before the temple was destroyed. And after it was destroyed, the size of this diaspora did not increase very greatly. Most of the Jews who survived the Romans' destruction of the country remained in Palestine. It is not particularly far-fetched to conjecture. Bro, getting back to everyone is Turkish, isn't it actually 100% true for Native Americans? They came from the Northeast Asia via the Bering Strait. Yeah, dude, dude, that was one, that was 16,000 years ago, okay? That's insane. That's even more insane than this. That's why I'm laughing at it. Okay? Like, that doesn't even exist anymore. What are we talking about? Look at a fucking modern map, dude. There is no land crossing. <laughs> when I say everyone is Turkish, it's like, yeah, that's actually a great example. Because, like, while there is genetic ancestry... In, uh, I think, like, the, the, the teeth of the indigenous population versus, like, Turkic uh, peoples in general. Like, uh, it, it's, it's such a ridiculous concept because, like, Turkic did not exist as a concept at that point. Okay? It was not a thing. Yes, indigenous, uh, indigenous populations did, did cross the Bering Strait. This is correct. Like, 30,000 years ago! That's ridiculous. It's like saying everyone is African. <laughs> what are we talking about? How far back do we go? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is what it is. Like, how far back are we willing to go to make our, to make our uh, insane, <laughs> insane colonial ambition stick, you know? Yeah, that's so, that's pretty funny. Uh, Turkish Shadow says, there's like 5,000 year old rocks that Turks will uh, like write Turk on and then point to and see Anatolia was Anatolia had Turkic uh, populations 5,000 years ago. And it's like objectively not true. It also is a meme when I say like Santa Claus is Turkish or fucking uh, like ancient Greece is technically Turkish. Like all of that is a joke. Okay. It's not, I'm not being for real. The difference is. When you take that joke and you mean it seriously and you genuinely believe it and you actually uh, think that there is like this pantheonic mythos uh, that uh, that extends to 30,000 years of history. Anyway. Conjecture that they were the ancestors of those inhabitants who accepted Islam many generations later. A conclusion echoed by Nur Masalha, formerly the director of the Center for Religion and History at St. Mary's University, 
now with the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. It would not be unreasonable to- I don't really get why you keep watching GDF. His content seems good on its face, but a lot of it is received by super far right people. Yeah, dude, like when he fucking talked about the Haitian Revolution and how awesome it was. Classic far right guy, GDF, dude. Like, remember when he talked about why the Haitian Revolution and the fucking unimaginable untold amounts of fucking violence that came after it uh, being, you know, understandable considering what led to the Haitian Revolution? Another classic case of, you know, far right people. They love the Haitian Revolution and all the white people that were murked in the aftermath. It's crazy. Of course, a lot of fucking far right people look to this shit especially as it pertains to Israel, because they're like anti-Semitic as shit, and they want to mask their uh, resentment towards Jewish people, Judaism, and, and all of that stuff uh, with, with like, you know, any kind of, any kind of basis, uh, any kind of like, uh, like real valid criticisms, because if they were just like, be like, oh yeah, Jews are like demons who fucking have horns and, and have always controlled society and we must purge them, is not something that you can fucking say and and be and get broad reception over. Yeah, super far right defending the Viet Cong and the IRA. <laughs> Arguments that you make about the GDF and far right reception is literally a criticism that like Divorcelli and his community have tried to launch against me as well, even though he has aligned with Nicolas Fuentes, where I have always found him to be an abhorrent little gremlin. They now try to fucking pull that shit off when they're like, oh, Hassan and Nick Fuentes are identical in their opinion, in their worldview. It's like, yeah, get the fuck out of here. To argue that the modern Palestinians are more likely to be the descendants of the ancient Israelites and Canaanites than Ashkenazi Jews, many of whom were European converts to Judaism. Certainly historically, in contrast to the myth of exile and return, Many of the original Jewish inhabitants of ancient Palestine had remained in the country, but had accepted Christianity and Islam many generations later. A view at one point held by Israel's earliest leaders, including David Ben-Gurion himself, if it can be believed. Writing in collaboration with Yitzhak Ben-Zvi, Israel's longest-serving president, the pair published a book-length study titled The Land of Israel in the Past and in the Present. Speaking of the Palestinian farmers, or Fellahin, the Fellahin are not descendants of the Arab conquerors, who captured the land of Israel and Syria in the 7th century CE. The Arab victors did not destroy the agricultural population they found in the country, they expelled only the alien Byzantine rulers and did not touch the local population, nor did the Arabs go in for settlement. Even in their former habitations, the Arabians did not engage in farming. They did not seek new lands on which to settle their peasantry, which hardly existed. Their whole interest in the new countries was- The reason why I hate this, and the reason why I hate like the, the myth-making of Zionism, is, be, is that because even when you engage in this argument, even when you engage in this argument, you literally go to like weird haplogroup, like ethnic and racial supremacist arguments, okay? Or even if it's not like supremacist, you're like, you like, oh, the Canaanites, like the descendants, uh, like the real, the real ancient Jews are the Palestinians is not something I care about or, and is not an argument that I fucking will ever make. Okay. I bring up the fact that every now and then I bring up the fact that like, yes, uh, a lot of the Palestinians are descendants of the people who did not leave, um, are, are descendants of the people who do not leave, but it's like, sadly, at least the anti-Semitic hallways, it's not even just anti-Semitic. It's just, you're turning into fucking measure head at that point. You understand? Like the notion that, um, you know, European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews have like not real, uh, not real Judaism in their fucking genetic lineage is ridiculous. It's ridiculous on its face. It's like, yeah, oh, they, uh, there were a lot of people who converted. It's like, who gives a shit? It was fucking thousands of years ago. You know what I mean? It's so stupid. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It just like goes into scientific racism real quick. And that is why the national myth-making of Zionism and its underpinnings in like 
3,000 years of Jewish history all of a sudden turn into this like weird thing because it's exclusionary ultimately. So even when you are, even when you are to, to argue against it, you very, yeah, you turn into, you, you turn it into fucking one drop rule shit real quick. Okay. Time without an oboe is back. He said, Chad, the Philippine were essentially a farmer class that worked lands owned by the Ottoman era landowners in, outside, in and outside Palestine. They were systematically evicted by the JNF, ICA, and other Zionist land buying institutions. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you read Elon Pape works? He makes up history and is very biased. Benny Morris has refuted his work. Yeah, dude, totally. Yeah, maybe if this was like, I don't know, 2007, you could fucking come up. You could do that, except... His work has been proven time and time again. Benny Moore, on the other hand, says shit like, you cannot trust the conniving Arab, even especially when the conniving Arab mind is uh, working in an organization such as the UN. Benny, the Nakba happened, but it was necessary Morris, dude. The major difference between Benny Morris and Elon Pape is that they are in agreement over history. It's just that Benny Morris thinks it was good. And now thinks it was like great. And has spent the rest of his uh, academic career trying to undermine the original work that he put forward because he realized like maybe other people didn't receive it in the same way. Uh, didn't receive it in the same way that, that he, uh, you know, brought forward. Anyway, that was cool though. Thanks. Was political, religious, and material to rule, to propagate Islam, and to collect taxes. Further, Despite the repression and suffering, the rural population remained unchanged. Indeed, the erasure of history regarding the myriad kingdoms, namely Himyarite, Khazaria, and Adiabin, whose rulers converted to Judaism, was essential to the- <laughs> Yeah, Persian soldier. The Nakba was needed for a Jewish state. He was right. Yeah, dude, you're a fucking monster. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. He said the Nakba was needed for a Jewish state. He was right. Okay, well, you're a fucking freak, dude. I, <laughs> uh, Perishan, Perishan soldier. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, just like the Lebensraum was needed for a unified Reich. It, actually, yeah. You, you do recognize that, that that argument lends itself, depending on who's talking, that argument on its face lends itself to, like, the exact same thing that the Nazis said about uh, genetic purity. Ah. Uh. That sounds fascist as fuck. It is. Yeah. Why are you against the only Germanic state? <laughs> yeah, literally. Why? Wow. You don't want the Germanic population to thrive? It's quite fucked up. Think about how much they got fucked over after World War I. The Zionist project from the very beginning. I would be remiss not to observe how this notion of the global Jewish community as a single ethnicity resembles the darkest days of European nationalist thinking. Daniel Goldhagen's ultra-famous Hitler's Welling Executioners notably addressed European and especially German anti-Semitism head-on in the book's first chapters. Notions of Jews being a nation were bandied about in the anti-Semitic literature. The definition of the Jews that was to emerge in the second half of the... Yeah, it's like old-school dual loyalty shit. At a time before there was no, like... There was no like uh, like thing that you could even point to. It's like yeah, Jews are always uh, out for themselves and and uh, are not just like integrated members of society. It's just like nineteenth century from the confusing fray of conceptualizations, namely that the Jews were a race, were given voice already in the first half of the nineteenth century. If the claim to the so-called Holy Land isn't a religious one, as the secular Zionist movement and its progenitors claim, then the alleged historic... Like, the, this is so stupid. The Himyar and Khazaria converted to Judaism. They weren't Jews. This is so fucking dumb, okay? One, I don't even think that that's correct. And two, who gives a shit? This is what I'm saying. Like, this is so stupid, okay? It's so dumb. It is so unimaginably stupid. Okay? Like, it, it is, it is, like, we're doing one drop rule both against Israel and for Israel at that point. Okay? 
Like, wh what the fuck is that? Like, there is no, there is no world where that is valid, okay? That that can be the, the basis for either a nation-building narrative or one that is, is supposed to disprove the nation-building narrative, okay? It is just simply not something that any reasonable person could, could bring up as a as a argument in favor or as an argument against anything it doesn't fucking matter it's also hilarious because yeah israel literally accepts converse settlers that's number one number two there are plenty of of russians that openly came from the ussr and afterwards that have no genetic or ethnic lineage traced back to judaism and i'm not even talking about like the matrilineal uh, uh, like genetic ancestry or whatever, and and they are now, you know, they're they're Israeli. So who gives a fuck? Claim lies firmly with the idea of an ethno-nationalist claim via blood and soil. The claim, as we've seen, is predicated. This is why I always feel uncomfortable when I talk about like the Israeli demographic uh, demographic uh, assessments, like the Israeli demographic, uh, like categorization of like jew versus arab i don't like it because one it's not correct okay and two it makes me sound like a freak when i say it because it is it's it is supremacist bullshit that's why i always feel a little icky whenever i talk about like well here are the polling results from you know the the uh, this israeli university where uh 90% of Israeli Jews, 90% of Israeli Jews believe that like the ethnic cleansing in Gaza must continue or whatever versus uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, Israeli Arabs don't. That, that is a, that is literally a, a demographic categorization that Israel has created. Okay. It forces me to adopt that terminology, even though I think it's fucking ridiculous. But the, the obvious consequence of that is when I say uh, Itamar Ben Givir is from Iraq and has Arabic ancestry, and I talk to uh, an Israeli, an Israeli sixteen-year-old, he's like, "What do you mean? He's not Arab. He's not Arab. He's not Arab." He's like, "You know, he is. He is." Aided on an array of falsehoods used to justify the violent dispossession of the land of Palestine, the word used continuously for the land for thousands of years. First documented in the late Bronze Age, about 3,200 years ago, the name Palestine is the conventional name used between 450 BC and 1948 AD. You are watching anti-Semitic channel? Okay, bro. Yeah, yeah, we got it. You, you on the other hand, you on the other hand are definitely not anti-Semitic, which is why you said Jews have to do ethnic cleansing to have a Jewish homeland and sucks to suck for everybody else. Like, this is why Zionism is inherently so fucking anti-Semitic. It's basically akin to being like, no, you don't understand. Like, Jews have this genetic difference where they have to do ethnic cleansing is insane. That is like an inherently and an insanely anti-Semitic thing to say, okay? Zionism is inherently anti-Semitic because it claims that Jews are of one mind. Jews are a monolithic international force. It is literally what the fucking Nazis were claiming as well. What the fuck are we doing? It's like taking on so much of what Nazis and anti-Semites have historically said about the Jewish population, which is comprised of like so many different cultures and so many different ethnicities as a consequence of, of Jews being uh, historically devoid of a homeland, okay? And, and picking up the, the cultural artifacts and, and, uh, and, and attitudes and ways of existence of every other uh, place that they lived in turning around and being like, no, you don't understand. They are monolithic, actually. I don't believe that, okay? I don't believe that Jews are monolithic. No matter how much Zionists try to come in here and say, no, 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 you don't get it. Like, their skulls are different. <laughs> what the fuck? It's literally the same shit Nazis believed. It's so stupid. To describe a geographic region between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River and various adjoining lands. The name Palestine was widely used by the most important ancient Greek historians, cartographers, writers, philosophers, and scientists, including Herodotus, Aristotle, and Ptolemy. 
the Greco-Roman Byzantine name Palestine is commonly found in major classical Greek texts, especially the history. The long and short of the story is that all peoples have an origin myth, and that's cool and good. What is bad is using that shit to justify actions, especially genocide in the modern world. It's the same principle behind fucking, uh, like, religion. I don't give a shit what you believe, as long as you're not going, this is the reason why I have to kill your children. Okay, this is the reason why I think, like, gay people should be purged from society. This is the reason why women sh can't have bodily autonomy and get a medical procedure that is oftentimes life-saving. It's fucking bullshit. When you take it to that degree, it's done. We're done. Huh. Histories of Herodotus, written near the mid-5th century BC. Further, I believe Zaziki is Greek. Do you accept that? No, I do not. You want to know why? Because the Turks were originally nomadic people, and horse milk was a you know, phenomenally important part of fucking Turkic cuisine that spans across a massive fucking uh, area, okay? So no, Suzuki is not fucking Greek. Shut the fuck up. Palestine existed as a distinct administrative unit and a formal province for over a millennium, beginning in the second century common era with the Roman province of Syria, Palestina. Emperor Hadrian chose the thousand-year-old name Philistia the most common geopolitical designation for Palestine used by Greek geographers and historians long before the Old Testament stories were put together. With the advent of the Byzantine Empire, Palestine was separated into three provinces, Palestina Prima, Secunda, and Salutaris. Moreover, these three provinces were effectively governed politically, militarily, and religiously from Palestina Prima, as a three-in-one polity from the 4th century until the early 7th century. As was Iraq, under British rule following the First World War, through the three provinces of Baghdad, Basra, and Mosul. As the Rashidun Caliphate began their rule in the 7th century, the name remained as the province of Jund Philistine for four and a half centuries before being interrupted by the Crusades. With the Crusaders defeated by the Mamluks, the name was revived where it was the land of Philistine throughout the Middle Ages and well into the 20th century. To provide you a woefully incomplete timeline, a map containing Palestine by the cartographer Muhammad al-Idrisi exists circa 1154. We have additionally a map of Palestina from 1320 by Marino Sanudo. Jumping ahead to 1450, Fra Mauro completes the most detailed map in the world up to that point, showing Palestina the map of Palestina Moderna et Terra Sancta is published in 1480, jumping further to the 18th century for Palestina ex Monumentis Veteris Illustrate, published in 1714. In the next century, 1803, we see the Ottoman Jazid Adlaz Tarjumessa in the 15th century Mamluk literature, Mujir al-Din al-Mi, refers 22 times to Philistine. Okay, but like... Okay, but have you considered that perhaps these guys were all Hamas? Yeah. You need to you need to consider something very serious here. That they were Hamas. Hamas. In in his glorious history of Al Quds and Al Khalil. By the 18th century, we can see that Palestine as a distinct country was common perception in Europe. In 1747, Thomas Salmon describes Palestine for the modern Gazetteer of London. In the ubiquitousness of the name Palestine to... Bro, literally every fucking... Every person born that is now like Israeli or even historical Israeli figures that were born in historic Palestine literally had Palestine on their fucking birth certificate. What are we talking about? Hamas invented that concept describe the region is apparent certainly in the 19th century, as these titles show. Of course, Queen Victoria sponsored the Palestine Exploration Fund to explore. The funniest concept is when like, the funniest concept is when, when uh, people will be like, um, actually, being a Palestinian was invented by Yasser Arafat, which is psychotic. One, like the concept of a nation state is a relatively new phenomenon. What the fuck are we talking about? Especially for post-colonial nations, okay? Like if they if they did not have any sort of like empire that that remained, okay? Then yeah, it's it's a relatively new situation in the grander scheme of history. So the idea that like oh well the concept of a Palestinian was an invention. It's like every nation is an invention. 
National borders and boundaries are an invention. Okay? And a relatively new one, to be, to be honest. Okay? It's ridiculous. For biblical locations and obtain a foothold in the strategic location, the turn of the Victorian era coincided roughly with the descent into European nationalist conflict, which culminated in the First World War, after which the League of Nations universally accepted the name Palestine for the region now under British control. And so the British military governor Sir Ronald Storrs established the Palestine Archaeological Museum. The British Mandatory Government of Palestine produced Palestine passports, currency including the Palestine pound and postage stamps, uh, the colonial police force was named the Palestine Police Force. The government-owned railway company would be Palestine Railways, as well as the Palestine Sport Federation and Broadcasting Service. It wasn't just the British, of course, but also... What are you... What? A song by Jafarari, Arab slave traders capturing Africans, 10% of which survived to serve as harem monitors. What are you doing? You all right? So you want to have open global borders and then make everyone an immigrant? I think that, yes, in a truly, in a truly just world, yes, we would not have, like, like, national boundaries would be utterly meaningless. I do believe that. National boundaries would be completely meaningless. Not to be all, like, we're all one race, the human race, but anyway, let's continue. So the first Zionist Congress with their Basel program calling for the establishment of a publicly and legally secured home in Palestine for the Jewish people back in 1897. The Zionist settlers established the Jewish Agency for Palestine, the Palestine Post, the Palestine Office, the Palestine Orchestra, the Anglo-Palestine Bank, the Palestine Electric Company, the Palestine... By the way, people are already uh, borderless, for the record, okay? We are. It's just that... That opportunity is only open to rich people at this at this stage. Okay? I could go wherever the fuck I want on the planet for the most part. I think that, you know, that opportunity should be afforded to all people across the board. Water Company, the Palestine Mortgage and Credit Bank, Automobile Corporation. Of course, later on, a systematic renaming of the destroyed villages, a result of the Nakba, or catastrophe, of 1947 to 1949, entailed the renaming of place names, often arbitrarily, using a revived modern Hebrew language. Indeed, a 1956 committee report of the official Government Names Committee, set up in 1949 by Ben-Gurion, to rename Palestinian towns states that a decisive majority of the names were determined by mimicking the sounds of the Arabic words, a partial or complete mimicking, in order to give the new name a Hebrew character following the accepted grammatical and voweling rules, said longtime defense minister Moshe Dayan, Jewish villages were built in the place of Arab villages. You do not even know the names of these villages, and I do not blame you, because geography books no longer exist. Not only the books do not exist, the Arab villages are not there either. There is not a single place built in this country that didn't have a former Arab population. Detractors of Palestinian history, who apparently totally dominate the Western narrative of the region's history, will challenge the legitimacy of the Palestinians' indigenousness to the land by claiming that there was no sovereign kingdom of Palestine before 1948, or that there was no such thing as a Palestinian, a claim made famous by Prime Minister Golda Meir, birth name Mabovich, an immigrant from Ukraine. But not all states, it seems, are held to this standard. After all, the term Ukraine was apparently first recorded in the year 1187, or 16 centuries after Herodotus' histories. Additionally, the use of the term Ukrainian, according to the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, One criticism of Zionism sounded by German-Jewish intellectuals going back to the 20s was the secularization of Messianic Judaism. Hannah Arendt once met then, um, then Foreign Minister Golda Meir at a cafe. Golda told her, I'm a socialist, so I don't believe in God. I believe in the Jewish people. Arendt was shocked. The greatness of this people once came from the fact that their love of God was greater than their fear of him. Now they only believe in themselves. What good can come of this? Once the religious tie to its land was shed, what's left? What's your justification? It becomes mythological, racial, fascist is buried everywhere in Zionist mythology, from the imagined heroism of the Battle of Tel Chai to the Hebrew revival, to the Hebrew revival's appropriation of messianic language to describe secular processes. You can't unsee it. 
Rebuilding the temple is no longer an abstract future. It's making a state. And that takes blood. A lot of blood. Yes. The secularization. Or not even secularization. But like. When you take religious beliefs. That uh, can be complex. And what people. What people uh, associate with. Uh, like a contextual, contextualization of the world. And turn it into. Uh, a a underpinning or a nationalist mythos you ultimately arrive especially because it's like uh, inherently fascist you ultimately arrive at like a lot of people who don't make any fucking sense like this is why i always talk about how like jewish people are more often than not super not fundamentalist okay obviously you have orthodox jews and whatnot but ultimately a shit ton of jews are secular it's an ethno religion and a shit ton of Jews are in, 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 like ultimately secular. However, Zionism makes up for that in terms of, of uh, having a shared collective purpose, a shared identity. Uh, and it is instilled and reinforced over and over again, where, where it basically turns into a religion in and of itself. So even if you're secular and you're like, yeah, I don't give a shit about any of this, like, you know, religious stuff. I love bacon or whatever. You still have this inherently, uh, you still have this inherently like almost religious, like dogmatic belief in this nation state that is doing a shit ton of violence. Zizek sometimes repeats a joke from anti-Zionist Jews that goes, Jews believe in Israel. Jews in Israel don't believe in God, except that he gave them the land uh, of Palestine. I mean, it's a joke, but it is kind of, it is, it is true. Like it's, it's a, it's a bunch of secular people, atheists that turn around and they're like, it's a bunch of secular people and atheists turning around and being like, no, like the biblical text is actually historically accurate. It's crazy. It makes no fucking sense. It's kind of similar in some ways to like the American, the American identity. So, so closely being associated with like capitalism and individualism. And, uh, you know, Americans are not by and large, very religious Americans are by and large, not very religious, but like we treat capitalism, like it is our religion. The constitution is the Bible and the founding fathers of the fucking prophets was a term of relative obscurity as late as the 19th century. Ukraine at various points in its history enjoyed only brief and fleeting periods of relative autonomy though under the thumb of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and especially Russia. Though in the Western world, the sovereignty of Ukraine is very much not in question. Their claim to nationhood and their right to live free of foreign domination and destruction are seldom challenged. The reality is a grim one, that a modern European ethno-nationalist ideology utilized religious mythology and symbolism unfounded by the actual historical record. The shift from a deeply unpopular fringe group to a powerful entity with the backing of the British Empire culminated in the bloodshed that erased hundreds of whole towns, literally wiping them off the map, and depopulating the area of the new state of Israel of some 750,000 people. More were to come in subsequent bloodbaths. That the religious and furthermore empirical justification of this slow ethnic cleansing and ongoing genocide of the indigenous people, the Palestinians, is fraudulent is one of history's most cruel insults. Regular viewers of my work will know that recently I've been hard at work producing a series on the Israel lobby. This volume you're watching now is the first of a series on Zionism. The Nakba and all its horrors will be the subject of the next one, and it will be my most important video yet, by far. Yeah, um, the, the <laughs> irony, ooh, the real reason why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Johnny's pumping out some fucking videos. The real, the, the funniest part about it is that like the, the pro-Ukraine, pro-NATO Andes who are also pro-Israel fail to consider that like Russia's arguments, Vladimir Putin's arguments for why Ukraine is actually technically Russia are fucking identical. And if not a part of closer history than Israel. And it's national, uh, it's, it's uh, like the Zionist argument for Israel. It's so fucking funny. The funniest part to me is the debate pedos are trying to say GDF is a secret groiper, groiper trying to destroy the left from within. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. That's why he has spent literally all of his work. Uh, literally all of his fucking work uh, talking about, you know, white people getting murked for the most part. White, co white colony and, and colonial ambition being met with uh, being met with an untold amount of violence. So what now? You are pro Russia? Yes, dude. No, I'm not pro Russia. I'm pro top of the hour ad break. Okay, and I'm pro getting better baits for the top of the hour ad break. By the way, than this one because that was weak. That was weak sauce. Okay, I'm pro avoiding the top of the hour ad break by subscribing for five dollars or for free with a Twitch Prime. Early Americans use the same arguments for the genocide. They talked about it being the new Jerusalem, how God is manifesting it, and how it should be a shining city that will bring about biblical rule, but somehow stuck with Israel and not with America. I don't know how. Uh, Twitch Prime is free. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Okay, let's watch this. Uh, why doesn't international law apply to the West? By first thought. Damn, this guy's good.